Good evening, everyone. Good to see you in church here tonight. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for this invitation into your house again this evening. We thank you for the opportunity to gather with our brothers and our sisters and to um, think of some of the, um, the issues which cause us difficulty, cause us pain, um, cause uh, conflict and, and dissent between uh, the world that we seek to evangelize and uh, the truth of the Christian faith. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to kind of think of these things and discuss through them, to verbally process with one another. But Lord, we know that real wisdom comes from you alone and from your word. And so we ask that you will bless our conversations, that your Holy Spirit will be at work this evening, and that as we leave, uh, we may have just a little bit more confidence in our uh, trust of you um, and be able to uh, look ahead to the possibility of discussing these things in a different setting with those who don't love you. Help us in that regard, Lord. Help us to be faithful witnesses of your goodness, your holiness, your love, your wisdom, and your awesome creative power. And as we uh, turn to these slides now, just with this thought in mind, Lord, we just ask that you will equip us for your service. All these things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, <clears throat> third Sunday of the evening, and we are back on uh, another one of our big question topics. This evening, we're going to be looking at what the Bible says about the theory of evolution. I say it at the beginning of every single one of these, but I'll say it again, an enormous subject and to cover in, you know, in sufficient depth um, within 15 minutes or so um, of, of what we need to know and how we respond to this is just an impossibility. So um, that's my caveat at the beginning um, that you know, we'll do what we can, um, but this is a massive, massive topic, a massive conversation as well. Unlike topics like assisted suicide and transgender issues, this is not a relatively new phenomenon. And discussions around the origins of life on earth have gone back hundreds of years, even before the uh, 19th century when Charles Darwin wrote his seminal work, the snappily titled On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Uh, however, uh, coupled with his later work, The Descent of Man, this proved to be the launch pad for a movement which proposed and proclaimed that humankind arose from natural biological processes rather than being created by God and in his image. Over the years, this idea has become popular to the point of being taught as uh, undeniable fact in our educational establishments, which creates an academic stumbling block challenging the origin, content, and message of the Bible. Now, I could and would dearly love to spend about, I don't know, the next two hours unpicking uh, this theory um, from a scientific perspective and exposing the many, many holes that exist in it, but the, really the purpose of our sessions here on Third Sunday are to be looking at what God's Word says and allowing that to shape our thinking and our approach to this kind of debate. But in order to do that, we need to begin, as we usually do, by defining a few things that we are talking about this lovely picture. We're going to start with some rudimentary biology for anyone who didn't study at school. I don't know what you were thinking. It's a wonderful subject, but here we go. This here, um, this is a strand of uh, DNA. This is the molecule that exists in every single cell type in our body, with the possible exception of red blood cells and the dead cells of our hair and skin, which don't have any. Uh, and specific sections of DNA called genes code for the proteins that we find in our bodies, um, which uh, provide the structural equipment and that enable all the processes of life. DNA codes for RNA, which is the messenger which takes um, the, the code of these genes into a particular piece of uh, machinery in the cell, and the proteins are created um, as a consequence of that. Now, every strand of DNA, and therefore every gene, is made up of repeating units called nucleotides, and every one of these sticky out bits here represents a nucleotide. Um, there are four different types, only four. Uh, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine are their names, but you'll maybe see them as just the, their initial letters, A, C, G, and T. Now, in a perfect world, these codes, these orders of letters that are in our genes would never change. But we live in a broken world, and as a result, there are many things which will change this code, and we call those changes mutations. And depending on the type of mutation and where in the code that mutation arrives, different parts of the protein that is made from these genes uh, can also be changed and they can make a different form of that protein. Now, evolutionists believe that these mutations are responsible for the entire diversity of life. 
that every species started as one organism and we all mutated into different things and the ones that cope best with our environments lived long enough to reproduce and pass on the genes and the versions of the proteins that we have onto the next generation or that they were better at attracting a mate and so were better able to pass genes onto the next generation more effectively. And as the theory goes, over a very long period of billions of years, a few million of these changes have led us to all the species that we find on Earth. Now, definition of evolution then is the process by which different kinds of living organism are believed to have developed from earlier forms during the history of the Earth. But we have to be careful about the distinction between what is called microevolution and macroevolution. Because microevolution is a, a, a term which is used to describe the changes in how frequently a particular form of a gene will appear in the population. And that's something that will change in response to environmental factors. And when I studied genetics in the late 1990s, this was called variation. For some reason now it's called microevolution, which is an unhelpful change as it makes less clear what it is that we're actually talking about. It does, of course, enable evolutionists to claim that there is at least a type of evolution that has been proven to exist. And maybe this is the motivation behind the change in terminology. Either way, macroevolution, which is the term used for one organism evolving into another, has never been proven to take place. Microevolution has been proposed as a starting point for a process called speciation, where populations isolated by geography or some other environmental barrier will become separate species. And speciation is suggested as being the foundation of macroevolution. So, for example, you might have a population of bears. One group become isolated in a forest, another group by a river. Over time, the bears who hunt fish in the river develop useful characteristics for their environment, like shorter legs, bigger mouths, and so on. The forest bears continue to eat small mammals and berries, and so after a period, they don't look alike anymore, these two populations of bears. And eventually, according to the theory, uh, the river bears will go on to become some other creature entirely, like whales or something like that. That might sound irreverent, but it's a struggle to think of an example when no examples exist. For the link between microevolution, speciation, and macroevolution has never been accurately demonstrated. It's just a theory, it's just an idea. And speciation as a concept in itself is limited by how we actually define a species in the first place, which is uh, yeah, a constant conversation in this as well. But there are far more than biological things brought into the theory of evolution. There are aspects of chemistry, of physics, of cosmology uh, that come into it as well. But in the interest of time, we're going to stick with the biological side of things this evening and what we find in the Bible about it. But before we speak about the specifics of uh, evolution and our origins and the origins of the diversity of life on Earth, I just want to speak about the fact that this is one of a number of things that we will face that aren't moral or ethical challenges, but that seek to undermine the entirety of our worldview. The presence of such things in themselves, however, shouldn't upset us um, because uh, they are basically a demonstration of the truth of what Scripture tells us. For we know that not everyone in the world will accept the Lord, otherwise there would be no mention of the consequences of those for those who live outside of Christ. We also read in Psalm 14 verse 1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And for there to be any conviction or comfort in that conclusion, there needs to be something else that people will turn to when they consider their origins, which is why this theory is so prevalent and so prized. But of course, it's seldom that we observe a live and let live approach to the differences between the believer and the evolutionist. And so what we ultimately find in this debate is a, a mechanism by which the world will do all it can to disrupt and derail and inhibit our belief in God and the trust that we have in our relationship with Him. Jesus tells us why this happens in John 15, verses 18 and 19. He says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. The world will do all it can to make us feel small and irrelevant and childish and unintelligent because of the pride of those who belong to the world. We know as children of God, however, that we are relevant. We are loved, we are supported, guided and encouraged by our Creator and our Redeemer. And we are vindicated in our belief and trust of Him by the revelation that He shares with us through the things that He has made. Romans chapter 1 from verse 18 says this, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, 
because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. But with that inability or unwillingness to properly apply observation or extract the truth from them, then we are back at Psalm 14 again and in the realm of the foolishness that rejects God and His creative work. With that said, let's move on to look at some of the specifics of evolution. It's perhaps unsurprising that uh, the majority of the, uh, the, the verses that speak into this we find in the relevant passages of the Bible record of uh, creation, which is in chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis. In fact, uh, Genesis 1-1, the very first verse of the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But it's not just here in this account of primordial history that we are told this truth. For if we look in the prophets, we find in Isaiah 37-16, Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, You alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. And in 66, verse 1 of the same book, this is what the Lord says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? And so they came into being, declares the Lord. Moving on from the prophets into the wisdom literature and the Psalms, we find in Psalm 96, verse 5, For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. And if we move into the New Testament, we find that this is not just an Old Testament idea either. Into the Gospels, John 1 verse 3, speaking of God the Son, through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. And in the Epistles, Ephesians 3 9, to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery for which ages past was kept hidden in God, God who created all things. And lastly, Hebrews 1 verse 2, in these last days He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through whom He made the universe. Am I laboring the point here? I hope not, but I hope that you can see the consistency of message that we are getting, and through the whole canon of God's Word. It's not limited to one book, it's not limited to one chapter or one narrative, but is a theme that runs from beginning to end in the Word of God, to separate the idea of God being the creator of everything is to remove an integral part of the whole thing and to undermine the whole of the Christian faith in the process. But not only is God the creator of all things, but the manner in which He made things is attested to in Genesis 1 as well. Genesis 1, 11, then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds, and it was so. Genesis 1.21, so God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. Genesis 1.25, God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground, you've guessed it, according to their kinds. The individuality in each organism has therefore existed from the outset. It's not something that has been gained or acquired, neither is it something that can be abolished easily, and that is also seen in the blessing that God bestows on each species. Genesis 1.22 tells us this, it says, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And that wasn't a blessing that was limited to the birds and the sea creatures, but also the land animals and, of course, humanity as well. But part of that blessing that God gives there, as it says, God bless them, is the ability and the command to reproduce. And that ability only exists within species. God doesn't permit His handiwork to blend together into a formless mass. Instead, He keeps everything in the categories in which they were created. How do we know this? Well, we see the evidence of it in the animal kingdom today. What happens when we crossbreed animals of different species? What happens when a a horse and a donkey give rise to a mule or a hinny? What happens when a lion and a tiger are mated in captivity and yield a, a, a liger or a tigon? These hybrid animals are born sterile. They cannot reproduce. They haven't had the blessing that God gave to the animal kingdom to procreate. And the reason for that is because they weren't on His original list 
of created animals. And so the Lord doesn't give His blessing to them because they never should have been created. Nothing is accidental in God's creation. And one of the main driving forces of evolutionary biology is the accidental mutation. It's not something that's preconceived. Genes don't make decisions to do things. Animals don't make decisions as, as to what they're going to evolve into. It's all based on accident, whereas God's creation is based on order, purpose, and deliberate action. And that includes the special relationship with, that we have as humankind with God. This wasn't something that was lying in wait for us when we reached a certain distance from the primordial soup and achieved a particular level of complexity. We were made for this purpose, for a relationship with God, and to be over all the other things that He had made in the universe. But of course, it isn't the case that every single person on the face of the earth stands on one of these diametrically opposed camps, being a dyed-in-the-wool evolutionist or being a Bible-thumping six-day creationist. There are some who would look to bring some kind of harmony to the debate and that try to marry the claims of evolutionary biology with what the biblical account tells us. And the halfway house that emerges here is the concept of what is called theistic evolution. So, the idea here is that God did create the world and the universe, but when it comes to biological life, He created precursor animals, which He then either allowed to evolve according to the natural pressures of the environment, or He was active in guiding the process generation by generation until we have the diversity that we see in the animal kingdom today. The first issue that emerges from this idea, however, is that if it were true, it means that the Bible contains no authoritative and binding truth, but that it must be freshly interpreted and corrected for every era and in every situation. This is what happens when we have to reshape the biblical record in light of scientific, or what's scientifically fashionable, let's put it that way, instead of seeing all other things through the lens of the revealed Word of God. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 tells us that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is a verse which affirms the timeless relevance of Scripture, and that is completely undermined and withdrawn if we have this idea of uh, theistic evolution being the, the, the cause of our origins. But this isn't all that's difficult to reconcile. For there is a statement here made about God's method in theistic evolution that doesn't match with what God tells us about Himself. How many times do we read in Genesis 1, and I haven't listed them, uh, as God surveys His accomplishments day by day in the week of creation, the, the, we find the words in Scripture, and God saw that it was good. What does this mean? It means that everything He made was exactly the way God wanted, and it fulfilled its purpose exactly the way God willed not as a precursor to what thing, something might become, but as the finished article. And then, of course, there is the issue of death. At the heart of evolution by natural selection is this ability and effectiveness of one organism to pass on advantageous characteristics to the next generation. The only reason that a characteristic is identified as advantageous is because it's seen in the animals that survive and are successful in reproducing, successful in passing their genes on to the next generation. Those that don't have this ad advan advantageous characteristic are the animals who don't survive. Death is therefore one of the driving forces behind this process. For animals to evolve, many, many other animals must die. And since even the most naturalistic scientists would agree that human beings are the most complicated, complex, and sophisticated organisms in the world, that means that if we evolve by this process, then literally millions, maybe billions of animals would have had to die. Okay, that's not a pleasant thought, but more importantly, it contradicts what the Bible says about the pathology of sin. You see, according to the biblical timeline, once God has created the plants and the vegetation of the world, the birds and the fish, the land animals and humankind, and uh, <clears throat> sin entered the world at that point, with the disobedience of the man and woman in the garden, and the penalty for sin is death. God told Adam exactly that in Genesis 2.17, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And as the Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans 6 verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, death appeared in our world 
only after God had made this rich variety of creatures that we all enjoy. This isn't a proof text that will make evolutionary biologists give up on their position, but it does demonstrate that the Bible does not allow us to bring this sort of compromise to what we are taught in its pages concerning how we came to be. As a consequence, I believe it to be an untenable point of view for the serious student of Scripture. We might ask, of course, why people still believe that this is the best theory, evolution that is, why this is the best theory regarding our origins. After all, any other scientific theory would have been debunked and forgotten about, given how many flaws there are in uh, the theory of evolution. But the reason, of course, that it has not is because without it, all humankind would have to submit to the God who created them, and their freedom to live for themselves, pursuing their own agendas and own plans would disappear. And at the heart of our sinful human natures, nobody wants to do that, certainly no one outside of Christ. The funny thing about evolution, the ironic thing about it, is that it requires faith. There's no more evidence for it than creation by Almighty God. In fact, when we critique the theory by scientific means, there is probably less. Hebrews 11 verse 3 reminds us, of course, that we need faith to appreciate that it is God that has made all these things. It says, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. The question we have this evening is where will we put our faith? In a clearly flawed scientific theory or the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, our Creator and Redeemer. But of course, and crucially, as we bring this uh, part of our service to a close, this is not about winning an argument, because every single person that, is a, a, that subscribes to the theory of evolution as the, the, the truth of their own origins is a soul that is there to be won. And we have to find ways to witness two people who disagree with us on this score. It's not just about besting someone in a, a scientific discussion or in a, 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 a sociological discussion or any other uh, discussions with ologies um, involved of any description. Um, we have to take the good news of the gospel to all people, and that's what we have to find uh, in our discussions this evening. What is the best way to witness to people who think that we emerge from primordial soup? Questions will go up on the screen. Um, I haven't printed them out. I apologize. Oh, Alexander has some hard copies, so if anyone wants a hard copy, then there'll be one coming round. Um, four or five uh, questions for this evening. Have a bit of a chat about it. Share your experiences. And when you find out how to witness to those who are died in the wool evolutionists, tell me so that I then know and I can then go and witness to them as well. Let's spend some time in discussion. Always good to uh, hear the, the buzz and the hubbub of conversation uh, on these evenings. Uh, I will just bring things to a close just to end the service, but if you're comfortable sitting there and still in the middle of conversations, please crack on. Um, I'm, well, I'm not going to chase you out the building, uh, so uh, that would be good. Um, so uh, I normally have a slide up just now with um, some resources on it. I don't have that. I've been flying by the seat of my pants today. I have to um, apologize that I haven't done that yet, but I will look at some things and I'll add them to a slide for next time, or um, we'll share it with you um, with a hand out of the door or something like that, but uh, you can keep an eye out for, uh, for that coming. Um, the reality is that there are lots of resources on the internet, some of them more helpful than others. Um, Answers in Genesis get a very bad name sometimes because uh, from, from some quarters, but I find that their um, articles on this um, subject are very, very um, persuasive and um, I would be heartily recommend that you look at some of those things. Um, but as I say, there's, there's quite a lot of information out there. I hope you've had um, some good discussion. I hope that you're um, maybe a little bit better equipped to, to speak about what the Bible says um, in opposition to, uh, to what is being taught as fact in our schools. Um, and uh, yeah, I pray that you'll um, be able to recall some of this stuff if you ever end up in conversation um, with someone on this topic. But let me just close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for the opportunity uh, to, to explore, to grow, and to discuss, uh, to help one another to see different points of view and to understand um, some different things. We thank you, Lord, for your word and for the wisdom that we find in there. We thank you for uh, just the fact that even though uh, on some occasions we might think that there's nothing in these pages that will speak to a particular situation, um, how effectively uh, you prove us wrong in that. 
and that you always have something to say um, through the pages of, our, uh, of your Word and our Bibles. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to speak to us through them and by your Spirit, and that we would grow as a consequence. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one. Amen.